This episode is brought to you by Set for Life Insurance. Listen, docs, one of the first steps we took to pay off our student loan debt was realizing we paid way too much for our disability insurance. That all changed when we found Set for Life Insurance. They helped us with a customized insurance policy that met our needs and most of all, budget. To learn more, check out setforlifeinsurance.com. This episode is brought to you by Physician CEO. Finally, a business program for busy doctors just like you. Get the skills of branding, marketing, entrepreneurship, and combine those with your gifts as a physician. Be known as a doc outside the box and define your future. Learn more at physician-ceo.com forward slash D-O-T-B. Welcome to Docs Outside the Box podcast. This is your official show, looking inside the minds of cutting edge and innovative doctors. Think you'll find these stories in any medical textbook? Sorry, you're getting real life insight from men and women pushing the envelope beyond medicine. Ordinary doctors doing extraordinary things. Let's start now with your host, Dr. Nee Darko. What's up? What's good, everyone? This is Dr. Nee, and <sighs> so look, I just took a deep breath because I just need to take a deep breath. There's a lot of stuff that's going on right now, and you all probably need to do the same too. So take a couple of seconds, take a big deep breath or wusa, a namaste, whatever you need to do. <laughs> There's a lot of ish going on right now, right? We got the coronavirus or the corona, as we say in our house, right? Make sure you all are washing your hands. I'll be shaking their hands right now, right? Like if someone puts their hand out, just go ahead and give them the fist pump, give them a dap. If you're from where I'm from, you do the head nod. You know what I'm saying? You look at someone, give them the head nod, like you acknowledge them. What's up? What's good? How you doing? Move on. Keep it moving. You know, nowadays, these viruses, what's going on from a health standpoint can really affect, obviously, what's going on from an economic standpoint. So as you all are seeing right now, the market is having these huge volatile moments, huge dips. They're saying that some of these dips that we are seeing, we haven't seen since 2008. It really didn't affect me much because I didn't invest uh, during that time, which, you know, I shake my head at and I'm like, man, that was a big mistake. I was in residency from 06 to 2011. And I have to say it, man, I just did not invest. I didn't know much. I didn't know any better. So don't blame me. I didn't invest during that time. So not only did I miss out on the huge drop from 2008, but I also missed out on three years of growth or two and a half years of growth in the years after that. But since then, I haven't seen any type of drop like this, but we are taking our deep breaths. We have a long-term plan. We dollar cost average. We would make our financial advisor really proud at this moment. But also at the same time, we're not looking at our accounts. We don't want those problems. <laughs> and I suggest that you all don't go into your web login, don't use personal capital, whatever it is to check your net profit or your net total worth at this moment or your stocks. Don't check it because you don't want those problems. I'm telling you right now. And that leads me to my next guest. And definitely what we're going to be talking about, I would say, is apropos to what's going on in the market. And my next guest is Ryan Inman. He is a fee-only advisor. We like that around here. And he has a firm called Physician Wealth Services. And as you can guess by the name, works primarily with physicians. He also hosts a podcast called Financial Residency. I want you all right now to make sure you subscribe to this podcast. It's really good. And as you're quickly going to learn through our conversation, he cuts through a lot of the bullshit. I really, really like that because that's the type of relationship that I like to have with my financial advisor. So we're going to be keeping it 100 on the relationship that you should be having with your financial advisor. We're going to be talking about who would benefit from a financial advisor. Not everyone needs one. You're also going to get a refresher on how financial advisors get paid. It's really important to understand that and then we're also going to be talking about some of the resources that you can use right now to educate yourself on making proper financial decisions so that you don't feel like you're following your financial advisor blindly. Also, before we get into the interview, I want you guys to go check the show notes. There's a little video that I put there from Our Rich Journey. As you may or may not know, I had a virtual summit in January. And I actually interviewed this couple. They are a couple that lives in Lisbon, Portugal right now, but they're from the United States. And they went fire and they retired at the age of 39 and 41. They've been featured on Good Morning America. And, you know, they made a really good video on what it's like to be 
financially independent, retiring early, and having a huge market drop right now. So it's a really cool video to watch. I think it's something to, you know, if they can do it, one of those things that I can do it also if you watch that video. But listen, make sure you share this episode with someone who you think would definitely benefit from this. Make sure you rate, make sure you subscribe to this podcast. And without further ado, I present Ryan Inman with Financial Residency Podcast. Let's get it. Ryan Inman, host of the Financial Residency Podcast. What's up, man? What's good? How you doing? Welcome to Docs Outside the Box. What's up, man? Thanks so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, man. I'm glad we were able to connect. I know we connected. Has it been over a year now? I can't. Yeah. It's been over a year, a year and a half at FinCon. Yeah, man. So we connected at FinCon. We were supposed to connect, but life happens. And a year and a half later, now we're here. So I'm glad to have you on the show. It's called the toddler effect. And you have two of them running around on both sides. Tell me about it. And what's interesting about that time is me and my wife had just got back from some medical humanitarian work in Africa and Ghana. And we brought our son with him to meet the rest of his family. And we got back maybe, I think a little bit over 24 hours. And then we flew straight down to Orlando, to FinCon. Already then at that point, it was a whirlwind. Crazy. Yeah, man. So look, I'm excited to have you on the show. You host the Financial Residency Podcast, which is pretty popular among physicians, obviously. But you are here because you are a fee-only financial advisor. You work exclusively with physicians. So I want to kind of break that down a little bit. Talk about some common things that physicians go through. You know, talk about a little bit about your background, why you work with physicians. And let's just go from there. How's that sound? Yeah, it sounds great. I think the background makes the most sense because it wasn't like I woke up one day and was like, I'm going to target physicians because I think they're wealthy. Yeah, what's up with that, yo? Because that's, that's how, a lot how it works. Of, I used to think like that also, you know, after going through, you know. Hey, I know, wish it was that way. I was on your show. And my experience has always been when I first started off with all the missteps that I made, it's just, I felt like I had a target on my back. So whenever you I do. heard that financial works with a specific, you know, group, you know, even like I'm sure athletes feel the same way. Like there's agents who only work with athletes or what have you you know, your ears start to perk up. So let's break it down. So it'll be forever broke. All right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that works. So yeah, the first thing that would kind of go off in your brain is like, why are they only working with this certain subset of the population? Is it because they know something special? They have that experience? Or is it because they know how to exploit it? I've heard both kind of sides <laughs> to it. It's terrible. But my industry is terrible. Unfortunately, like I hear both sides of this. So I always start by saying like, look, I'm part of a physician family. My wife and I have been together since we were 18. That is freshman year of college. So she has put up with me for 17 years. And uh, we've been way around now, right? And it's funny. So like- I love being married to a physician. I'm not going to lie, man. It is because every fourth night I was felt single. Like it was like I was home and it was like, hey, this is cool. We didn't have kids at the time. Like it was me and the dogs. And it was like every fourth night she spends the night at the hospital. Like residency and fellowship were really tough. So, you know, but four years college, four years med school, three years residency, three years fellowship. She's a pediatric pulmonologist with the Navy, civilian, but with the Navy here in San Diego. Loves what she does. So I'm, of course, happy wife, happy life now that she's found a place to do it. But there's a lot of sacrifice that goes into the careers. I mean, you guys know this. And for the spouse, it's a ton of sacrifice as well. So I've decided I was working for another advisor million dollar minimums, high net worth. Most of it was pre-retirees and retirees, great experience, but I couldn't work with anyone like me. And I tried to kind of develop the program to work with physicians who were just starting their careers that were in our situation, that we had so many decisions to go through, so many choices, and it just wasn't available. So basically not having any type of savings whatsoever, no financial or investment information at all. It's really hard to start off. I get your point. And it wasn't a possibility at the firm I was at because they only wanted to work with people that could pay their high fees, which I understand from a business standpoint, you want to maximize revenue and minimize the work you have to do for that. But it didn't make me fulfilled. It wasn't part of what I really wanted to do with my career. So Uh, About four years ago, I set off and started my own firm called Physician Wealth Services. And it's a fee-only financial planning practice. I work with physicians all across the country. And I only work with physicians because I want to work with people like us that are going through the same things. So all the stuff my wife was pitched, all the different whole life and the disability claims that you need to do and 
know, if you don't do it now in residency, you're going to miss out forever. And it's like, oh, kind of, but not really. Yeah. Oh man, you're shuddering. I just gave him a heart attack when I said whole life. So I know everyone's heard that story, but yeah. Yeah. So that's why I truly work with physicians and they are very unique. You guys start super late into this saving and investing game. And you start usually with a negative net worth because you have student debt. Whereas most of the people you maybe went to college with, they started, you know, at 22 years old, they left college. They were earning an income. They were putting money in their 401ks. They maybe had some student debt, but definitely not 298,000, which is the average debt that our physician clients have. Again, we work with hundreds of physicians across the country, and that's the average that they have. And we have a couple who don't have any. So maybe that average is, could be a little bit higher in that standpoint. So yeah, that's essentially why I work with them. And there's just so many unique things that go around there that you don't have the ability to save that early. And so when you come out, there's you know, you're making from 50,000 to 300,000. You know, there's a lot of choices, a lot of planning that needs to occur. We oftentimes hear about athletes who lose money because, you know, they weren't in a situation where they had a whole bunch of money and then all of a sudden they get to this stage and they get a whole bunch of money. And, you know, how are they supposed to be able to manage all this money when they've never even had to write a check, basically? Although it's not the same thing, I kind of liken it to the same thing. If you're asking someone who's never had a job, probably had their first job until they get into their 30s, right? Serious job until they get into their 30s to now all of a sudden be able to handle, you know, over six figures and not allow, you know, the lifestyle inflation to kind of kick in. So I'm sure you see that a lot. Unfortunately, yeah. And honestly, the med schools and the residency programs, I mean, our high schools, let's just go back. Like everyone is doing a disservice to the physicians and honestly, all of our population with financial literacy. But as we're talking physicians, like med schools know this, residency programs know this. I mean, you're taking out so much debt from med school. The least they could do is teach you about it right? But they're asking you to sign on a whole bunch of money. And they really don't give you any true resources to work through it. So that's the exact reason why my podcast exists. Because I look at it as you know, this is the training that you should have received the financial training and residency. Let's break that down. Let's hear yeah. more about your podcast. What's up with that? Yeah, so I look at it as like, let's go, you know, five feet down and a mile long, right? I want to explain everything that you possibly need to know, to make yourself aware, more confident, about your finances, but also to protect yourself so you don't get kind of screwed from other people who are preying on you. And you mentioned the target on your back. Like, unfortunately, you do have a target on your back. My wife, super smart, way smarter than I am. Like, perfect score, ACT, SAT. Like, she's brilliant. When we first started talking finance, she's like, well, I just paid the minimum. Like, that's what they want me to pay. And you're like, no, pay the whole balance. It's like, well, why? This is what they, they're like, no, no, no. Now, granted, that was, very, very early in our relationship. I don't think she wanted to know this much, but she knows quite a bit about finance just because I literally <laughs> talk about it and torture her all the time. And some people, I'll look at it as glass half full, aren't lucky to be married to a planner. My wife might say the opposite. Actually, she has on my show literally blasted me about being married to one. But you're not expected to know this stuff. You're an expert in your field. Right? Well, There's no way I could do surgery. I see blood and I like want to pass out. Right, I right. couldn't do what you do. Why does the entire world think that you can do what I do without any knowledge or resources to do it? Now, there's a lot of stuff out there. And I'm not saying everyone has to work with a planner. I, I don't believe that. I don't think that the majority of the population should work with a planner. But there are people who just won't do themselves the correct service of researching, analyzing, looking at stuff, actually doing a plan and then holding yourself accountable to it. Right? I kind of look at this as you know, almost think of like when you go to the gym, there's people who go religiously every day and they look amazing because they're all big buff and have these six packs because they truly love what they're doing. They're in it. They know it. They don't have anyone to tell them. And then there's the people like me that I would need to have a trainer because the trainer is the one that's going to actually hold me accountable. I can be like, oh, I, I'm meeting, you know, Jane, my trainer at the gym. Like I can't just blow her off because I'm busy at work. I got to get my butt in the gym. So that's I, the I, only way I could do it. I think this is the part that I'm sure you shake your head at and, you know, you look at some of your colleagues and you're like, man, you put out a bad name for us. So how do you get that balance between having someone or being someone who's just accountable to a physician in terms of making sure they make the right decisions, 
making sure they're not pulling out their money when they shouldn't and so forth versus completely handholding them. And then, you know, next, you know, a physician is saying, well, my guy's handling things or I follow, you know, blindly what this person is doing. And oftentimes you make those mistakes, right? I'm sure you've heard the horror stories. How do you get that balance in the middle, right? Yeah. So one, I don't care who you work with. It could even be me or not. Like my clients, I would tell them this, like, I love my clients. I want the best for them. Sometimes I feel like I want it more than they do, but no one should care more about your money than you do. Thank you. Ever. Can you say that again, Ryan, please? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no one should care more about your money than you do. Right. Right. You're busting your butt. You're getting up out of bed, sacrificing time away from family, friends, whatever, to go work and do something. Hopefully, you love medicine and hopefully you're enjoying it. I know burnout and all these other things that, you know, kind of come up and occur through pretty much every conversation we have. But you're getting up out of bed, you're working, you're busting your butt for a paycheck. Now, hopefully, you're not spending the whole thing. But no one should care more about that money than you. And if you hire someone, make sure you're hiring the right person to do it. You might be hiring yourself to do this. And if in your best interest, hopefully, you go through and say, hey, look, I've got the time that I want to read up and study some of this financial planning stuff. We're going to talk about some good resources and books and whatever. Do that. You know, Listen to podcasts and read blog posts and talk to people. You know, there's communities around it. You join our community. There's communities around it where we're talking finance. It's not taboo. You can kind of crowdsource a bunch of information, but personal finance is personal. So take what everyone else says, everything else you've read, and then relate it to yourself. And if you look at this and come back and go, I want to do this myself. You're smart enough to do this yourself, but do you have the time, desire, and effort to put into it? And if you don't, you might have to hire someone to help you. But if you look at it and go, I'm good, I got this. Maybe you need a quick checkup, cool. But if you can hold yourself accountable, you don't need a planner. And that's what I think everyone gets wrong is that it's either one extreme or the other. Everyone has to have a planner and everyone should never have a planner and buy your financial advisor. That sounds great for maybe half the population, but maybe half the population really needs it because they don't want to do this stuff all day, every day, and they need to trust someone. That's a good point. I like that point. I feel the same way. Like you said, you don't have to go to one extreme or the other extreme. You can kind of just kind of be in the middle. I think oftentimes you hear the horror stories. People don't really know, you know, one, how to avoid those type of situations. How do you properly vet someone? You know, one of the things that I really like about you talk about how you get paid, which I think oftentimes we don't really think about from a physician standpoint, like how exactly am I paying my financial advisor? Can you talk more about that, how you get paid and just kind of the different structures if you can so people understand that? Yeah. So there's two big distinctions. There's fee-based planning and there's fee-only planning. There used to be a bunch of commission stuff and trading and the old school boiler room stuff, but that's pretty much gone now. But if you're looking for a true financial advisor, someone that's not just going to manage investments and not talk to you, they're actually going to work through problems and all the stuff that they should be doing. We can look at fee-based and fee-only. So fee-based, the easiest way to make the distinction is does someone sell insurance? That's usually the easiest way to tell. If they do, they can earn commissions for selling insurance, which is not bad. And people make this out to be a bad thing. The problem is, is they have conflicts of interest, a lot of them, because now it's, hmm, is me telling me this, you know, I'm making you the planner. Me telling me this because I really need that disability policy. I won't say the other word. Or is it because... (laughs) Or is it because? <laughs> Wait, hold on. Let me tell you, So I had, I'm sure you all have know that I had a really bad experience with whole life insurance. So me and Ryan actually recorded for his episode and like the veins just started popping out of the side of my head when I had to go back and talk. I was like, I might need to know how to do surgery on this poor guy. <laughs> so that was a small little outtake. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Man. No, you're good, man. So, okay. So, you know, is me telling me this because I truly need this coverage? Is he trying to sell me this because I need it? Or is he telling me this and trying to sell me this because this is how he makes money and pays to put food on the table? And it's not a bad thing. Their insurance is super archaic. The way that it's structured is you have to have someone selling it and you will have to have that agent there that handles the relationship. The thing is, is what product are they selling? If you need insurance, your planner should not be selling it. Your planner should have as little conflicts as possible in what you're doing. So fee-based planners 
they not only do financial planning and investment management, but they sell insurance. So they're just riddled with tons of conflicts of interest inside that. And NAPFA did a study that basically said like 97% or more than that of anyone who calls himself an advisor or a planner basically is fee-based. So the other side of this group is fee-only, which I know we know mutual people that are fee-only. I am fee-only. And what that essentially means is the only money that I can get paid is from directly from my client. So I don't sell products. I don't earn commissions or kickbacks. I introduce you to a CPA. I can't receive a Starbucks gift card in the mail for referring me out to a CPA. The only money you can make is literally from the client, whatever it states in the client agreement. So, so it's really black and white. So basically, I come into the office, I tell you that I want you to look over my finances, help me make some decisions, and then you send me a bill, basically, at once you do all of that stuff. So As you'll come in and we'll lay out and say, okay, if you want to work with us, it costs X amount per month or per year to work with us. And usually it's an annual fee that you break out either quarterly or monthly. But we break it out monthly because I like people thinking in a monthly manner. But we would sign the agreement and then we would start the work. And as we're going through and analyzing what you need and what you don't need, and if we would have saw, hey, look, you need doesn't have any disability coverage. Well, I would say me, we need this. And here's the riders we need. And here's the policy for the amount that you need. Now, I don't sell this. So we're going to go to the open market to independent agents and we're going to get some quotes. We'll probably get two or three quotes and I'll leave it up usually to the client to negotiate, like basically go and complete the application and that, but I'm there every step of the way. And so are a lot of the other planners that do fee only work for other professions and things like that. But the important part is, is I don't care which person you choose. I don't care which truly what policy you choose. As long as it's got the right riders, the right benefits, and you're not overpaying, use whoever you want. And now there's no conflict. And your fees are the same, whether I got $2 invested or if I have a million dollars. Is that what you're saying also? So there's different, everyone's got different fee structures. So I can't say what everyone has, but usually there's either an AUM fee or a flat fee right? AUM is assets under management. So if an advisor is going to manage money for you, let's say it's 50,000 bucks, they can choose to charge you one or 2% to facilitate that, or they can wrap it up into one flat fee that you pay to work with them. And some people charge a flat fee and an AUM fee. They kind of double dipped. They view it as two separate services. And some people just wrap it up together. Everyone's kind of different. And it's kind of how everyone wants to run their businesses. And I don't think there's really a bad way in the beginning to really get started. The AUM fee structure really benefits the advisor the more money you have. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is, let's say you had a $400,000 portfolio. They're going to charge you 1%. So you're going to pay $4,000 a year. That's a pretty fair price for whatever you're hopefully getting the right services from that advisor. But if you had a $4 million portfolio and they're charging you 1%, well, that's $40,000. I wish I could tell you with a straight face, our firm is worth $40,000 a year. I ain't going to we're not. I want those problems though. <laughs> I want those problems, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, unfortunately, that's what all of society thinks we all have as physicians and physician families is like, we're all rolling in like Scrooge and Duck, just hanging out. I love it. I didn't realize the furthest from the truth. <laughs> But I so, see what you're saying. Though. I get what you're saying. Though. The more money. So have, those scale really fast. Now, the more money, more problems. Right. Let's be real. Right. You have more money. It's going to take more work. But that fee should not be scaling in a percentage way. It should scale with pretty much the amount of hours worked. And the advisor should be getting close to that. It shouldn't scale, though, in relation to percentages. So something that newer physicians don't really have to worry about. But the idea is like, if you're going to hire a planner, you should want to work with them for the long term. Mm. So make sure their fee structure is something that you're aligned with not only now, but 20 years from now. And that person's still helping you figure out that hey, you're paying for college, you got expenses now, all of a sudden you're about to retire. Oh, by the way, you have 4 million, I'm going to charge you 35, 40,000. That's ridiculous. Gotcha. To do that. So that's why the fee structures are important to understand. And on my site, I believe in full transparency. Like, Absolutely. As much as I'm a complete open book, anyone can book a call and literally ask me any question. And I will tell you personally what my stuff is, how it works, what we do. 
sometimes my wife jokes and is like, if you didn't have a conscience, like I wouldn't have to work. I'm like, yeah, if I sold insurance, I'd make four times more money, but it's not what I want to do with my life. I want to do the right stuff. And so I believe that if you put your fees out there, people will self-select. Hmm, that seems a little too much for me. I'm not going to value that relationship enough. I'm not going to reach out or upfront. And they like the transparency and the honesty. And I'm like, this is what it is. Like, you want to work with our team? This is how much it is. I know we're going to deliver way more value than that. But that's why I like transparency. Most advisors are very, very uncomfortable putting their fee structure out because they feel like they might not capture enough of the complexity. So they always want to be able to reserve the right to raise their fees. And because we work with all physicians, I know where most of our clients are coming from and how it works. I have literally walk the walk. So I know how long it's going to take us to do this stuff. And that's why I'm comfortable charging a flat fee. Mm, I love it. Now, you know, if you go through all of your podcast episodes, you can see obviously you work very exclusively, even in your interviews with physicians. You know, I want to get your opinion on the complexity of learning to invest yourself from a physician standpoint. You know, you say that, you know, obviously what we do in becoming a master of the human body, that's really complex. And, you know, learning, you know, investing may not be that complex, but sometimes you may need someone to help you. But that oftentimes can make people feel like, ah, you know, I can't do this. It's completely two different things. What if you just want to kind of just jump into just learning a little bit about how to invest for yourself? What are some recommendations that you have out there? Yeah. So let's set the air really clear, really quick here. You're a physician. You are likely the smartest person in the room when you walk into it. Doesn't mean that you know everything. It just means you're really, really smart and you can pick this stuff up. So if you think that you have the time and effort to put towards understanding investing, you will be able to do it. The one part that you might not be able to do is be objective. Mm. And that's usually where an advisor should make the most difference. What does that mean to be? So like we're not selling... It used to be back before the internet that you went to an investment manager or advisor and they're selling this like black box concept. Well, you come with me and I'll get you invested and we'll beat this returns and we'll do all these things. Well, there's Nobel Prize winning research now that shows index funds, investing in index funds will outperform over the long term than active management, people who are trying to actively beat the market. And it's easy to see that. Turn on CNBC during the middle of the day and you're going to see you know, Jim Cramer yelling, buy, 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 sell, sell, sell. And these guys, you know, basically talking up all these sectors and things to buy and stocks. It's all crap. It's all crap. There's literally Nobel Prize winning research that shows that it's crap, but it's what people believe that most planners do. When in reality, it's, we're protecting your money from you. We're making sure that you're not going to make the bad decision to sell when the markets are down or to be way aggressive when the markets are up. And we see this so much right now because we're recording this at the end of 2019. We're seeing this. We are in like a 10-year bull market. The market is just going straight up pretty much. We're seeing a little volatility here and there, but pretty much the market is just going nuts. Everyone that we're working with wants to take more risk. And I'm going, you know, one, there's two parts to risk. Possibly, yeah. Yeah, well, there's two parts. It's, you know, your ability and your need to take risk, right? If you have to take more risk, because I pick on pediatricians all the time, because I'm married to a pediatric pulmonologist, like, if you don't make that much, because you're a pediatrician compared to your peers who might, you know, in surgery, make a lot more, you might have to take a little more risk, right? But if you are saving a lot, and you're doing all the right things, your ability might be higher than your need. So we have to balance this, where do you fit in the risk tolerance? Well, as Markets are going crazy. More people are more aggressive because they think, well, gosh, I could just throw money in here and it's going to you know, double in five years. Like, great. But when the volatility occurs and all of a sudden we have another 2008 type recession and you lose half of your money in the exactly what you're talking about when you lose 50 percent or 40 percent or what have you. Do you yeah. So if you had 100,000, you look now and like all of a sudden it's 60,000. You're like, oh, my gosh, what just happened? <laughs> Let me take you know, I, I stopped looking at this for three months and all it went boom. Well, are you going to sell or, or are you going to continue to buy or are you going to freeze? And an advisor, a good advisor should be able to help look and go, hey, look, when we set this up back five years ago, when we started working together or whatever it is, we discussed this was the plan. This is the time frame. Just because markets are irrational and people are going crazy doesn't mean you should. And so hopefully they're there to protect your money from you to keep you going down that path. But if you're the type of person that's like, 
I'm good. I'm rock solid. I know myself and I won't do dumb decisions because others around me are, then you probably don't need to hire someone to help you with that. And you can learn with just a few good books and podcasts, how to invest. It's not that difficult. The difficult part is basically in your brain. I agree with you there. I think nowadays, you know, definitely since the Great Recession, I think with all the financial independence that has kind of popped up since in the blogs, the podcast, you know, it's all there for you to kind of just find out and kind of get that virtual mentorship. You know, that's how I look at it. You know, so, you know, for me, the biggest thing that I was always fearful is, is like, I remember like a distinct memory, my father losing his job, you know, in 1989. That was, you know, right after, you know, Black Monday, I think, or whatever. I can't remember if it was or not, but I think it was 1988, the stock market crash. And then soon afterwards in 89, he lost his job. And I just remember like it was related to the stock market because he lost his job. You know, since then, I've always had this healthy fear and maybe even just actually not even healthy, just a, you know, a fear that wasn't based off of anything, just that visceral reaction of, well, the market went down, my dad lost his job, you know, times are really tough. I'm never, ever going to invest in the stock market. Or if I do, I'm going to let someone completely take over and just follow them blindly. Don't follow anyone blindly. Again, no one cares more about your money than you do. But that was your exposure to money, right? In the beginning, like this investing, things go sideways equals bad. And that's a, you know, false belief, I think. But it was your personal belief because you literally experienced it. So getting away from that is going to be tough. Right. But you can do that through education and just seeing how the markets move and actually studying the markets to see that it moves up and down. It changes every day. No one knows what's going to happen. If they tell you they do, they're lying because no one can do it. Otherwise, they'd be wealthier than Warren Buffett and relaxing on a beach. Hmm. You knew what the market was going to do and you can foresee the future. I want to hang out with that guy. Yeah, so do I. Because no one else knows what it is. Like, (laughs) they don't it's all fake news if you want to call it that way i guess and now a word from our sponsor meet dr arthur cummings he's a busy ophthalmologist practicing all the way in dublin ireland recently he finished physician ceo check out what got him to jump on the transatlantic flight to participate in this program my initial response would simply be just do it This is one of those programs that is so good. It's very likely to be the best education you've ever received. And you realize then as a physician, how little we really know about our businesses, even though we're running businesses that are quite large. And the level of training is so fantastic. The education is so good. The faculty is immaculate and you're in a group of people who are like-minded. So just the entire environment is an amazing learning experience and really a good incubator for growing your practice. So if you're a physician who's looking to start your own venture or even lead your practice or department, then you can't afford to miss this opportunity. Class is filling up. Learn more at physician-ceo.com forward slash D-O-T-B. Give us some resources. What kind of books or anything that you recommend? Obviously, your podcast is very helpful. But if someone wants to read something, give us some resources that you recommend. Yeah, so there's a couple of books that I typically recommend for people that want to just understand how some of this stuff works. The first book that I really, really, really like is actually by another advisor. And his name is Alan Roth. And he wrote the book, How a Second Grader Beats Wall Street. Oh, wow. And it's a super clever book that he essentially is relating investment principles to basically explain index investing, how an intro, you know, a beginner can do it from the lens of a second grader. I know he has a kid. I don't know if this was actual case or not, but he wrote it and it made a ton of sense and worked together through. Now, I think his son was named Kevin in that book, but it was a fascinating book. It's a pretty quick read. And I think it's definite high recommend for someone who wants to understand investing. The next book and or books, because they kind of go together, is The Millionaire Next Door and The Next Millionaire Next Door. So Thomas Stanley had done a book, gosh, I want to say 20 something years ago. And he actually covered what the millionaires typically look like that you wouldn't ever expect are millionaires and some of the characteristics or traits that they have in becoming a millionaire. And it was fascinating. Unfortunately, he died a few years ago. And his daughter, Sarah Falah, 
was writing the second book on this, the follow-up or sequel of this called The Next Millionaire Next Door. And then it took her a little bit of time to, you know, kind of get back into writing and finishing the book her and her dad had started. And that came out, I think this year, and it's fascinating. And I've had her on my show a couple of times because she's got actual data from certain professions. And one of those professions is physicians. So she mentions in her book a bit, we went through and kind of were talking about what it is. And we essentially got to the point of like, physicians are income statement rich and balance sheet poor. Hell yes, that's true. Right? Yeah. You make a ton of income, right. but you don't have a lot to show for it, especially in the beginning. And it takes time. But these like through different principles and traits and characteristics and things that you can do and the mindset that you can have around it, you will be successful. But you have to go against the grain of what society is telling you. That you're a physician, you should be driving the nice, big, fancy car. That you should have the Dr. McMansion you know, rolling in. You don't need those things to be rich. And it's usually the people who don't have those that are the wealthy ones compared to the ones who do have it. So those are both excellent, excellent books. And then the last book that I would probably recommend for anyone just trying to kind of figure out how this is going, like we all know you have debt. All of you should know you have debt. And it's all about the 300K range. Some of you are more, some of you are less, but you all have a lot of debt and it's okay. You can talk about it. You can acknowledge it. The last book here is by Dr. Corey Fawcett, oh, yes. and it's called The Doctor's Guide to Eliminating Debt. We you know can Dr. Corey Fawcett. Yeah, great guy. Great guy. Super smart. A surgeon. So you guys can be buddies there. But, you know, it was an excellent book, and you can crank through it pretty quickly. And I hope that after reading this book, along with those other ones, your mindset and your relationship around money changes, and you kind of can get really motivated to make a difference in your lives. Yeah, I don't know when this is actually going to drop our episode, but in January, I have our book coming out, the financial residency book. So it will be congratulations, man. It's going to be super fun. So the book is all about basically creating a plan for yourself without actually having to work with an advisor and be able to walk through the step by step process of how you should think about your finances and, you know, get a general overview of where you're at and hopefully put a plan together that if you want to DIY, they're free to do it. But some people might realize that after you put this together, implementation of it might require a financial plan. Mm, that's a good point. There's the knowledge and there's the action. So exactly. I agree with you on that. I appreciate you giving us those resources. I think these are really helpful. I'm going to put them in the show notes. Two additional books that I'm going to add. The first one is something that completely changed my perspective on investing. It's called The Simple Path to Wealth. It's your roadmap to financial independence and a rich free life by J.L. Collins. Basically, it's his blog post coalesced into a book. I did not know about him really before this book came out. And then once I read to his website, I was like, wait, hold on a second. This is, <laughs> it's basically his blog post, which I didn't mind. So I read this book literally in two overnight calls. I'll let you know how busy this place was. But in two overnight calls, and I learned everything that I really needed to know about stock investing, index funds, how the stock market, for the most part, on average, is going to give a certain rate of return and how you have to really prepare yourself, like you said before, for those really big drops and how, you know, the success really is in going through those really deep dives and then kind of riding the waves and then going back up. And when the market goes up, you continue to invest. I really found this book. It really was like that for me. It really opened my eyes into the world because I'm telling you before this, I was really nervous. It's really scared. I really felt like I didn't have the gumption really to get this investing thing going. And since then, I mean, I haven't looked back. So I definitely recommend that for the listeners also. The Simple Path to Wealth. I'm actually going to do a review on this book, actually, in a separate episode. And then the next one also is The Boggleheads Guide to Investing also. That's a good one. Yeah, that's a really, really good one. Basically, a support group that used to work with, you know, Vanguard, and it just kind of just exploded into, you know, I wouldn't even say a cult following anymore. It's like huge now. But it's a really good read, very easy to read, something that you can read on a plane if you're a locums or if you're on call, you can read literally in a couple of days. Yeah, that book and the How a Second Greeter Beat Wall Street are pretty similar books. That might be a little more technical than that one because I've read that one too. It's a fascinating book. So I'd say like beginner investors, the How a Second Greeter Beat Wall Street, beginner to intermediate, then I'd say pick up that book. 
it's interesting you mentioned about the previous author, the daughter who wrote The Next Millionaire. I guess it's The Next. The Next Millionaire Next Door. And her name's Sarah Fala. Okay. So it's interesting that you mentioned that and talking about doctors being income rich, because there's an article on Kevin MD that came out a couple of months ago. But basically, it's talking about how doctors are living paycheck to paycheck, basically exemplifying what she was talking about in her studies. And I want you to be honest, like how often are you seeing this with the physicians that you're working with where, you know, they are bringing in a ton of money, but because of that lifestyle inflation or just the way how they live life in general, like they oftentimes find themselves having to get to the next month to pay for their expenses. Yeah. So I'd probably say 15 to 20% of mm. the people we work with really that make more than half a million dollars combined as a household and are paycheck to paycheck. Wow. Wow. Now, oftentimes, do they recognize this at all? Or is it like after you kind of go and do a thorough assessment and then they find out after your assessment that, wow, we're really living paycheck to paycheck? Or they already no. Already? Normally what happens is, and we call it lifestyle inflation. I think you called it that, lifestyle inflation. But I learned that from you, actually. Okay. So you get out of training, you go from making 50 to, let's call it 500 for this case. Not everyone does. I get it, but humor me. And all of a sudden you were not comfortable living off 50. You'd like to spend more. And instead of living off, let's say a hundred, eventually your lifestyle just kept creeping up and you kept thinking, well, in this monthly mindset of, well, if I can afford the monthly payment, I can afford it as opposed to paying cash and saving and doing those things. And eventually you wake up and usually it's five to seven years after you finish and you've been attending five to seven years and you look at and you're like, where's all our money going? We still have negative net worth. Our student loans are still here. Uh Oh, we've got consumer debt. You just kind of like wake up one day. Mm. And that's usually what happens is something sparks them a change, whether it's they're going to have kids, they want to buy a house and get rejected. They go apply for a credit card They're you know, and having to balance transfers and something, usually some event sparks it and they go, "Uh Oh, what happened? How did this go so wrong? And that's usually when they're reaching out and trying to figure out like, how do we fix this? So of course, you got to analyze everything. It's like running labs. Are you going to analyze everything before you prescribe what's going on? And essentially, you got to help them figure out how to get out of their debt. Why did they get in that in the first place is usually the biggest thing. I was going to add, it's got to be an emotional component to this. Absolutely. I call financial life planning. Like I'm a registered life planner. Like (laughs) it's the money and life, they're interchangeable. Like you can't have one without the other. I've never had someone come to us and be like, no, I just want to earn a whole bunch of money and then die with it. Right. You're like, I want to do these things. I want to write a book. I want to travel the world. I want to pay for the kids college. Like whatever your goal is, that's awesome. But most people, you know, physicians get out of training and I hate this analogy, but it's the only way I can really think of it is you've had this carrot in front of you forever. Do good in high school, get good grades to get in a good college. It's a good example that you use. It's, it's terrible. It makes me like ill saying it, but it's the best way. If anyone listening has a better one, like I am super for changing this up, but you know, you got it. You're trying to get in a good college, then in good med school, then you got to get, you know, into a great residency program. And then you got to get a great job. The whole time you've just like one step after another, you've had this very programmed, you know, process. And then you get out and you're like, freedom. What am I going to do? Well, I guess I'll just keep working. I guess I'll keep doing this. And then you just kind of spend your money here and then spend your money there. And all of a sudden you look at it and you're like, I deserve this. I deserve that. Oh, and trust me, I get it. Like, I remember it was, you know, Taylor was going, you know, I really want a new car. I deserve this. And I'm like, yeah, you do. But we can't afford that just yet. Like, yeah. Just hold on a little longer. Right. I, we I want to go on really nice vacations. And, you know, we've never, you know, traveled in this fashion of going into a really nice hotel and all this, like we deserve that. And I'm like, we deserve a vacation, but let's not go overboard and blow out our whole travel budget in, you know, one trip for 18 months, right? Let's kind of ration this and go on a little more vacations, but not as nice. So I'm always kind of like pulling back. Sometimes I'm the guilty one. And now she knows to pull me back in every once in a while. But you know, you you gotta, you gotta have some, you gotta have some times, I guess, every now and then to splurge. It's just, you know, maybe, you know, you can still plan for those, right? That's the kicker is you can still plan for that. So the way I look at it is, let's make a really easy example. Your birthday is the same day every year. Your spouse's birthday is the same day every year. You know, it's coming, you know, you're going to buy her something nice. It suits her. Maybe it's not even expensive. It could be 50 bucks or it could be 500 bucks. Like it's relative. 
but you know, it's coming, you know, you have kids, you know, Christmas is coming, you know, it's all on the same day every year, mom and dad, whatever you should be saving. So you're going to spend like, I don't know, $600 on Christmas gifts, save $50 a month in a savings account, and then splurge on Christmas and spend $600 on all these gifts. But you've pre-planned it. And it was something you made as a priority. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point. You know, for us, it really was, you know, once we went on our honeymoon and we realized that we would never, ever be able to, you know, do what we did on our honeymoon. We went to New Zealand, we went to Australia, and then we went to Bali and we were able to pay for it, you know, because we planned for it. But we just knew from a lifestyle standpoint, from the debt that we had, all these different things that would never allow us to do this again. And that's when we said, you know, something is not right. We got to change something about our life. And that's when we started looking at our finances and started prioritizing paying off debt, so forth. So, you know, I'm really interested with getting your perspective on the FIRE movement, right? Which is financially independent, retire early. What's been your take on this? Because this is something that's relatively new nowadays. Yeah. So really quick on your honeymoon story. So this is the downside of being married to a planner. I go, honey, we have a bunch of debt, thanks to you, which is totally cool. I know it's there. I was well aware of it. But we can't afford to go on the vacation that she truly wanted. So we did like a nice cruise. And it was like a fraction of the cost to do that. Now, I owe her at some point that I deserve. Well, it's no, I owe her a really killer trip. Now that we're out of debt and all that, which is cool. I want to do it too. But you know, that's the outside of being married to someone who gets it immediately. I was like, Oh, no, no, we're not doing that. The fire movement to go back to this. So I love the FI. And I hate the RE. Why? What's here? What's up? The whole financial independence. This is going to essentially working towards that. And what financial independence is, is that your investments, the money you've saved and that's earning here can pay for your lifestyle without you needing to bring in additional income. That's essentially financial independence. Then at that point, you can decide if you want to work in medicine or not, or become a librarian, work as a barista, like do whatever you want. Right. But that's the five part. I love that piece right? Because I want everyone to be able to do what they truly love. And I hope that a lot of the physicians truly love what they're doing, but maybe not necessarily the hours and the, you know, EMR and all that other stuff that goes with it. But I hope you guys truly love what you're doing because you spent so much time and effort and dedication to get there. You sacrifice so much, like you do deserve more things. And I wish as society, we could do more for that. But the RE part really bugs me. Now, I think there's two camps of this. The retire early that's like, I'm legit retiring and now I'm going to like hang out on a beach and do whatever. And the other part is they're retiring to something. So it's essentially right. a way for yeah. to give themselves to quit whatever they're doing. It's the, maybe the reasoning, the excuse or whatever it is to quit the bad thing they're doing and to start something new. And my thing is, if you are that unhappy with what you're doing, right? You work Monday through Friday and five sevenths of your life sucks. You need to figure out what you're doing differently. Just stop working in that job and find something different. Doesn't mean you have to retire early and wait till that number to then do what you love. Start doing what you love now. That's been my whole beef with the RE piece. No, I think it's a really good point. I think it's a valid point. Actually, that concept is pretty much the reason why Docs Outside the Box exists. So that doctors can see that there are, you know, different alternative ways that you can really thrive outside of clinical medicine. But I also know that for the most part, sometimes the issues with people is not that they hate medicine. It's just like what you said earlier, is that they did like to pull back a little bit more. But yeah, I mean, if you hate it that much, then yes, you probably should consider doing something else and do it sooner rather than later so that you can do this when you're vic- when you have all the vigor in you, you're still excited and so forth. But I think for the majority of people, they love it. It's just that they like to pull back a little bit on it. And but I appreciate your take on things. Do you oftentimes feel that like the financial independence part is pushed too much though? Are we at a point where we really should be considering it? Or you know, sometimes you know there are things that are just overplayed or overblown. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think the fire movement is just getting started. I really do. I still think in the circles that we might interact, like FinCon, <laughs> it's everywhere, right? It's huge. It's, you go outside of that. So Choose Fi is probably the biggest podcast that really pushes financial independence. And if you go outside, most people still have never heard of it. 
still have never heard of financial independence or the FIRE movement. I still think that the masses really haven't caught on yet. So I think we're going to see it grow. I think the FIRE, quote unquote, is going to spread. But is it overplayed? Again, I hate the RE part. And I know that I've gotten literally hate mail about RE and how I don't like it and why I should. People get very strong opinions, which I love. I can, but I can imagine. And it's worth the vigorous debate though, right? So it, Absolutely. And I think truly the second probably biggest problem I have with it is that most people, because it's a new movement and maybe not a new idea, but it's kind of a new movement that's gaining steam. They've never experienced a down market. So I'm seeing a ton of people who are firing at a million bucks or 800,000 because they live off 25,000 or 30,000 a year. And they're like, well, this is you know 25X, my annual spending, I'm good. I never have to work again. It's like, well, when that market corrects 40%, then what are you going to do? Because now instead of living off 30,000, you have to live off 18,000 or 16,000. Like, can you do that? No, you're probably going to have to go back to work. So they haven't fully thought it through. It's kind of like the newest and latest and greatest. But the ones that have really thought it through, that are taking it serious, that understand what it is, I think that they're going to propel this movement forward. And I think there's a lot of room for it to grow. I like that it is. I don't think financial independence is ever going to be overblown because I think that's every financial planner's dream is to get all their clients to be financially independent. To fire you or? (laughs) Sure. Like if I, no, no, it's all good. But like in reality, if I'm different than so many other planners because yes, I are. want to work with people for the long term. I want to get to know your kids and all that. And we all kind of grow together. I think that's amazing. But if you come to me and you're like, look, I want to be able to eventually do this on my own in three years, but I want you to help me get there. And I'm happy to pay your fee to get me there. I'm going to be happy to work with you because you're going to be engaged. You're going to be wanting to do these things. You're going to be responsive. You're going to be fun to work with. I'm going to be excited when me calls me on the phone. I don't choose to work and neither does my team to work with someone that is unresponsive. We fire a few clients because of this. Like if you're not responsive or if you're disrespectful of either our time or our staff, like we don't want to work with you. Life's too short. Mm -hmm. So if you tell me, Hey, I'm going to work with you for three years and we get there and you're like, Hey, look, I know a ton. And I'm like, yeah, you do. Like, this is awesome. I have fulfilled more than just, I made some money and a business is running. I have helped change someone's life. And that is by far the coolest thing to me. There's plenty of ways to make money. That is the coolest way to make money is changing someone's lives. And I know physicians, you guys change people's lives every day. Like that's the core of your job. But in my industry, that is quite abnormal. So look, this actually turned out to be a really good discussion. We covered a lot of different topics. Hold on. You didn't think this was going to be a good discussion. Well, you know, it's, oh, it's, it's, personal finance. Fired. it's personal finance, you know, and, you know, sometimes it could be a little dry, you know, but, you know. It, just remember, I haven't done the intro to your show just yet. <laughs> but listen, I'm look, I'm, okay. how many episodes I'm behind? I'm going to have the last word. Trust me. All right? no. <laughs> I got to get my episode out. But, you know, I felt like, you know, we kind of, you know, really hit a bunch of different topics that I think is a pain point for a lot of different physicians. You know, the thing that I really want to get from you is like, what's that one thing that you want people to kind of take away from this conversation? Put you on the spot. No, it's good. I like being put on the spot. If you're to take anything away from this one, no one should care more about your money than you do. Yeah, I agree. And two, please have a plan, not just a financial plan, a life plan. What is your ideal life look like? What do you want your schedule to look like? Whether that's your schedule during the week that you work or the days that you have off, like plan those things. And it doesn't have to be perfect and things change, of course, but just have a plan for your life. If you're married, what does your spouse really want to do? There's three questions that George Kinder, who's kind of like the father of life planning asks, and I'll say them now so you don't have to go search for them. And if you guys can ask yourselves these three and be truly honest with it, I think you're going to get so much value out of this exercise, and it'll take you maybe like an hour. The first question essentially is, if you woke up and all of a sudden you had enough money to take care of your needs now and into the future, think of it truly as unlimited wealth. What would you do with your life? What would you change? How would your life look like if money were no object? The second question is, you woke up, 
and you went to the doctor and she told you you have five to 10 years left to live. You're sick, but you won't feel sick. You'll feel normal, but you won't know if you die on the first day of the fifth year or the last day of the 10th year. How would you live your life? Would you change anything? And the third question is, the doctor tells you you have 24 hours left to live. Nothing can be done. Don't reflect on what you do in the next 24 hours, but thinking back on your life, what did you miss? What did you not get to do? Who did you not get to be? What did you not get to experience? And please don't be a doctor and say you get a second opinion. <laughs> right? I get that one all the time. I was about time. to say that to you. Guys. <laughs> I know. It's the doctor joke. I totally get it. But if you honestly sit down and you do those three questions with yourself and your spouse, if you have one, and you think about what your ideal day or week or year looks like, if you could have whatever you wanted, what would it look like in five years? Try to hit those targets. You won't hit all of them. And if you say, hey, I want to buy an island and own a plane and all this, like, probably won't. That's okay. But what's the next best thing? What's the next thing that you truly would enjoy? Is it material? Is it experiences? Is it doing something like writing a book? What is it? And that should be what fuels your plan. That should be what fuels your spending. That's, that's I, I guess, where that. I'd leave. Ryan, yeah, I, didn't, I wasn't expecting you to get all deep on us, man. Hey, man, I, it's, <laughs> it's what I want people to understand and what I want, because like, I, I see it so much the opposite. Well, yeah, I spend $1,200 a month on Amazon. I have no idea where it goes, but it just goes there. Mm-hmm. Like, well, what are you spending it on? Well, I don't know. I saw this book and I saw that table and I it adds up in two days. Like it's two days that prime. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, is this is are you spending in a way that makes you happiest? You're like, well, maybe. I don't probably not. It's like, well, where's that book? Well, I haven't read it. And there's 14 other books behind it. It's like, well, probably shouldn't have bought that book. I I know that's like a twenty dollar purchase, but it adds up. I think the key things in what you're saying, at least with those questions, is how do you live a more intentional life, basically. Exactly. I love that. That's an amazing set of questions. I'm going to put that in the show notes. So this was awesome, man. Ryan, this was great. Actually, I think we should do this again, man. Maybe do some some type of topics that are more, a little bit more complex, just to kind of flush things out. So I hope you think about coming back on because I'd love to have you on to talk about more complex topics. Anytime. Everyone listening, like ping me and tell them, hey, I want to learn more on this topic (laughs) and I'll come back and help talk on that topic. I'd love to do that. Hey, Can you take a moment, tell everyone how they can get in contact with you, how they can find out more about you, how they can even find out about your podcast, please? Yeah. So everyone where you're listening right now to us yap about all this stuff, you can search for Financial Residency. It's a podcast that I run and we're starting in October here. We've been running three days a week. So lots of good content happening, lots of education, talk about behavioral finances. And then on Fridays, we actually have our listeners, if they so choose anonymously to kind of fill out a form and call in their question, if you will. And we basically do like a financial health assessment on air. And it's really beneficial. It's been really fun to do those and, you know, be able to help people without them having to pay a planner. They just, if you're willing to share information and everyone can learn from it, it's been probably the number one catalyst for everyone just learning more as you get to see it in practice how it works. So then we do that. Financialresidency.com is where the podcast and the blog sit. We typically write one or two blog posts a week. So lots of good content there. And then the firm is called Physician Wealth Services and physicianwealthservices.com is our website. This is great. Ryan Inman, host of the Financial Residency Podcast. Thanks for coming on Docs Outside the Box, man. Thanks for having me on. It's been fun. 